There is a lot of really cool technology packed into the James Webb Space Telescope. Everything from the reflector, the size of a tennis court but thinner than a human hair, the cryo cooler keeping the instrumentation super cold, the ultra lightweight brilliant mirrors, everything about it is just a technological marvel. But I think the most impressive piece of technology on the entire telescope is this. This is a working replica of the JWST mirror actuators. It's possibly the coolest mechanism that I've seen in quite a while, so I decided to build one. These actuators are required because JWST's primary mirror is composed of 18 hexagonal segments. And these segments eventually will form a concave ellipsoid, which will reflect the light into the instruments. But this is a really challenging task because each of the segments needs to be aligned in seven degrees of freedom to nanometer precision, which is difficult on Earth, let alone on a satellite out in space. The actuator that we're looking at today handles the kind of kinematic adjustments. So there's tip, tilt, roll, Y translation, X translation, and then piston or Z translation. The seventh degree of freedom is actually the curvature of the mirror itself, and that's handled by a different actuator. As if this wasn't difficult enough already, it's on a satellite up in space, which means it needs to survive the rocket launch to get it up there. And even if it survives the launch, it needs to survive hard vacuum and cryogenic temperatures once it's out to its final destination. And because it's a satellite, it needs to be as lightweight as possible, but still stiff enough to hold the mirrors in their nanometer perfect precision position, and because everything on the JWST behind the sun shield can indirectly affect the thermal performance of these mirrors, it needs to be as cold as possible, so no active positioning that might emit heat holding its position. This is like an impossible set of engineering problems to solve, and yet it has been solved, which is just truly remarkable to me. These actuators were built by Ball Aerospace, and frankly, I think they're just geniuses for coming up with it. Let me read the specs for you. It's got a coarse range of 21 millimeters, two centimeters of actual travel distance, which is huge. The step size on the course is 58 nanometers. <laughs> the fine range, is 10 microns, and the fine step size is two nanometers. That's ridiculous. The thing only weighs 600 grams, about a pound and a half, and there are 108 of these total across the back of the JWST. Six of them are placed on each mirror segment, and they form a hexapod or a Stewart platform to control the six degrees of freedom. This is, of course, a 3D printed replica of the actuators that are on JWST. There is a paper that Ball Aerospace published in 2006 or so, which has some technical drawings and a few critical details about the gear train and dimensions of the actuator. And from that, I managed to essentially work backwards and cat up a replica as close as I could get it using the components I have. This is a true to scale replica. The actuators are about 150 millimeters. Mine's actually a little bit bigger because the bearings that I have are too big. And so it kind of forced everything to be a bit larger than it should. But otherwise, it's pretty close to what's on the JWST. The gear reductions are very similar, if not identical, depending on the stage. The flexure mechanism is essentially verbatim. So this is as close as we're gonna get without Ball Aerospace releasing the technical drawings themselves. Each actuator has two stages, a coarse stage, which is used to roughly position the mirror where it needs to be, and then a fine stage to really dial in the alignment. There's a single stepper motor, which is tucked inside of the mechanism, which couples directly to a one to 60 planetary gear reduction drivetrain. The stepper that I used is one of these 28 BYJ super common steppers, which actually has a 1 to 64 gear reduction, so it's very similar. Although amusingly, it's quite a bit bigger than the ones that they used, and it also has, you know, a lot more backlash and stuff. The motor then drives a set of spur gears, which gives you a 3 to 1 reduction, and those spur gears in turn drive a bevel gear and a camshaft. And it's the camshaft which gives you the fine control mechanism. The camshaft has a slightly offset cam in the middle, which couples to a bearing and drives 
the center part of this flexure. As the cam rotates, it places an upwards force on the center section. And as it moves upwards, it pulls the arms of the flexor in with it. And as the arms pull inwards, the very top portion of the flexor is forced to move as well because everything is kind of coupled. But it gives you a essentially a gear reduction between the cam motion and the top of the flexor. If we simulate this, you can see how the center section moves a fairly large distance, say a millimeter, whereas the top only moves by a couple microns. What's cool about this flexor is there's a lot of design latitude to come up with the exact requirements you want and the gear reduction needed. You can adjust the distance between the arms, the stiffness of the material you're using, the cross sections of the different flexure joints, the angle of the inner arm, how much the cam displaces the center section. Like there's a lots of different things you can do to adjust how much the top of the flexure moves. An interesting thing about this mechanism is it gives you a ton of precision essentially for free because you've got the resolution of the stepper itself, you've got the gear reduction of the planetary gear, you've got the gear reduction of the spur drive, and then you've got the reduction of the flexure itself. So one step on the stepper motor gives you, in this case, two nanometers of distance at the top of the flexure without having to do any super precise, you know, servo controlled and feedback mechanism. It's just based on mechanics and the gearing and the flexure. Now they do have sensors to check how much things have moved, but it's not required based on the mechanism itself, which I think is just super cool. The bevel gear that I mentioned earlier is used to drive the course stage of the actuator. The bevel gear couples to another bevel gear, just a one-to-one -one snow reduction there, goes through a shaft, through some bearings, down to a coupling disc. And these coupling discs are super ingenious, in my opinion. They're essentially flat discs that have two protruding pins, one on either side, and it's set up in such a way that there's essentially 320 degrees of backlash. So the fine stage is allowed to rotate for 320 or 30 degrees, whatever, until it hits the protruding pin of the course stage. And at that point, it starts to drive the course stage because the two pins are in contact. And as long as it keeps rotating in the same direction, it will keep driving the course stage in that direction. But if you stop rotating and go back the other way, it disengages from the course stage and now you're back to just fine control, which is super cool. And so the way they've done this is that you get a single stepper motor that can control both course and fine positioning using this mechanism. So if you want to go somewhere quickly, do a big course adjustment, you just rotate until you engage the pins and drive it to your desired location, disengage, and kind of go backwards a little bit, and then you can adjust the fine within that 10 or so micron period. If you need to backtrack and go the other way, you just throw it in reverse, engage the pin on the couplers in the other direction, and drive it back down. It's just so cool. The core stage has an additional one to eight gear reduction, and the big gear is directly coupled to a ball screw, and that's what moves it up and down. Finally, the last important thing is this brace at the back of the actuator. This is a torsional stabilizer, and this is needed because everything is just sitting on this ball screw and the motor is on top of the actuator. So if you were to just run it without any kind of stabilizer, it would just spin in place. You wouldn't actually get any lateral motion. So the torsional stabilizer is just a flexure joint on the back that allows the whole thing to stretch kind of in a linear direction but not twist. As I mentioned earlier, there are six actuators per mirror segment, and they're arranged in a hexapod or a Stewart platform configuration. And it's actually the combination of all these actuators working together, which is what gives you the six degrees of freedom. There's videos online about how hexapods work. They're really cool mechanisms. I thought about building one, but it was already enough work getting this up and running, let alone building six and all the kinematic control. So maybe someone else will do it. It'd be really cool to see one of these segments kind of working in real life. If you're interested in printing this yourself, I've uploaded it to, you know, all the 3D sites. Fair warning, it's not very printer friendly. Uh, nothing's tolerance to work right off a printer. I did a lot of sanding and filing and gluing to get everything assembled. So keep that in mind if you decide to do it yourself. 
I'm using a coarse M8 screw as the ball screw because you can't find a 21 millimeter ball screw. It was obviously custom made, but it is a little loose just because it's not made for this kind of application. So keep that in mind or add some Teflon tape or maybe find a fine threaded instead of coarse threaded screw. Shout out to the Orbital Mechanics podcast. That's where I heard about this originally. It was on one of their recent episodes on JWST. If you like spaceflight, rocketry, satellites, missions, upcoming missions, history of missions, all the technology behind any of it, interviews with people in the industry, highly recommend Orbital Mechanics. I've been listening for a couple years now and it's great. I love it. So check that out if that sounds interesting to you. Link is down in the description below. If you enjoyed the video today, consider one of these fine videos that Google thinks you will enjoy as well. Do the things people tell you to do at the ends of videos, and otherwise, I think that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.